All right, there we are. Good, good evening, good afternoon. Could be anything depending on where you are in the world. Um, I'm very excited to have this session uh, with you today, Ruth. Um, normally, as a track lead, uh, I'm asking people to introduce themselves, but now we have we have to introduce ourselves. So it's quite funny. Um, <laughs> yeah, let, let's go ahead Hi. and do the do the introduction. Hi, hi, Ruth. How are you doing? I'm doing great, actually. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to this session on open source contributions. It's something that's really um, important to me. So, yeah, I'm looking and an opportunity to share the stage with you, of course, Dennis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'm also very excited to, to have the session today. I also think it's um, it's a great follow up on what we discussed earlier today in the, in the various uh, presentations. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I'd say let's let's get going. Um, yeah, sure. I don't think we, we need to do any further introduction, but people are probably already tired to see us so many times. <laughs> yeah, probably. Well, I'm a project lead, in case you didn't know. <laughs> My name's Ruth. So, yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, OK, so great. So OK, we're, we're talking a little bit about um, what we've learned through our experiences with the Mortic community. So I thought it would be helpful for us to kind of take a bit of a step back in time to see where we've come from and where we're going. So if we take a few steps back in time in Mortic, there was no governance structure really uh, for the project or the community outside of code governance. So code governance was defined, but there wasn't really any other way for people to get involved. We didn't have the teams and the working groups that we have today. So there wasn't really any kind of like mobilization of resources in the community around ideas and projects. And there was also quite a significant dependency on Montekin for the future features, for fixes, for code reviews on the um, pull requests and for releases. And so this resulted in people being kind of unclear on how to contribute, unclear on what the process was, and also, how they could get involved. It wasn't really that clear, particularly if you were in a non-technical area of interest, for example. There wasn't really very much clarity on how the community could have a say in the future direction of the project or how we could have that dialogue with Mortekink, as is now happening. Yeah. And like a culmination of all of this was a really big backlog of pull requests. So that's features or bug fixes that developers have submitted to say, I'd like you to think about adding this to Mortic. And lots of issues, people saying, I found this bug or, you know, I found this issue in Mortic. Um, particularly when Mortic Inc. stepped back from managing the community releases in 2018. So where did we start? Well, we had to start somewhere. And, some of you who were in the community council panel earlier, this might be a bit of a refresh. So we had to start with governance, with defining, defining those ways for people to actually get involved, contribute, take ownership and get stuff done. But it is not for the faint of heart, obviously. There was so much work involved. We researched governance models from lots of different open source projects. We drew on our knowledge and experience of what worked and what didn't work in the communities we were involved in. Just because an open source project has a governance model doesn't mean it actually works. Um, we first shared the proposal in August 2019 for community consultation for two weeks. Then we had a response to that process um, where the community had given us lots of feedback. We took that on board and when we went back to the community with, OK, what do you think about this? Or like explaining some of the aspects that maybe weren't very clear. And then finally, in November, we um, got to a version that everybody was happy with. We answered all the questions, dealt with all the things that arose from that. And we put out a call for team members on the 7th of November with our first meeting on the 29th. So this is what the governance model looks like now, if you haven't seen it before. And you can access this on the mortic.org website and on contribute.mortic.org as well. Great. So what have we learned from the last 12 months? 
So I'm going to talk a bit about the human side of things of what we've learned. And Dennis is going to talk a bit more about the technical side of um, encouraging and supporting com contributions in open source. So you don't have to listen to me the whole time. <laughs> so from the start, I've always been really clear that we have to try to be completely transparent. From the word go, we've always tried to work in the public domain unless there's really good reason not to, and that tends to have four letters, GDPR, um, CC, all the other ones, you know. Um, so any public information, obviously we, we're not sharing publicly, but all of the rest of our work is on a shared Google Drive. We post all of our meeting minutes onto the forums, which is publicly accessible. Um, we do that about also being explicit what teams are responsible for, the kinds of skills that we need in teams, how you can get involved in teams, and then making sure people understand what's happening in the teams. Many of our teams have meetings asynchronously on Slack. So that means that the meeting leader, whoever uses your team lead, will post all of the topics as single topics in the Slack room, and then you reply to those topics in threads. And then we export that and put it up into the forums. And that runs for 24 hours. And that helps people who maybe English isn't their first language and following a session like a meeting where there's rapid exchange or conversation is quite overwhelming if English is not your first language. It also helps people who might be hard of hearing. It also helps people who for time zone reasons would be getting up at 4 a.m. you know, or joining us at like a really inconvenient time if it was a a call that was only at this time. And we kind of pinched that idea from the Drupal diversity and inclusion team meeting. So thank you folks for sharing that with me at DrupalCon because I saw that in action and thought, ah, we can use that. And I got to say from, from using this, it's um, I think it's very powerful in a way that you give everyone an opportunity to, uh, to really chime in and join the conversation, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So if we look at this, uh, like involving developers, so from a technical point of view, um, a developer can be of, of any level. It could be someone who just started coding or it could be someone who has been coding for years and is a senior developer, that's what we call it. Um, the good thing is that there's something for everyone and we're working very hard to make sure that it's also accessible for everyone. That means that uh, there's a lot of things um, that are that have to be done. For example, if you go to GitHub, there's a bunch of pull requests, like uh, Rotham already just mentioned. There's just a lot of things that need some attention. And what we did recently is we started to uh, come up with uh, a classification where we say we have a tire one, two, and three. So uh, one being easy, so small fixes. It could be as easy as, for example, a, a translation fix or adding new regions to a certain to a certain country. Uh, those are very easy to verify and to to approve and uh, merge into the product. Then we have th the second level medium. Those are for minor features or enha or enhancements. Could also be a, a bit more complex bug fixes, for example. This assumes that you have a basic level of knowledge in terms of, of coding and understanding what the code is actually doing. Um, most of the PRs will be tier one or two. We have one tier, which is uh, level three, which is hard. And this is for major changes in the product. So that could be, for example, introducing a Mautic marketplace because it's a big feature. It's a lot of code that's involved. So it needs extensive testing, both from a use perspective and from the developer perspective, so from the, from the code base. So we think by having this classification in these three levels that it's a lot more uh, accessible for new developers and new contributors to get started with, uh, with their contributions. Now, I got to be honest, the process isn't completely smooth yet. We've been doing a great job at triage. Um, Doing a massive shout out to Roth and to, to Norman mostly for doing that. Um, but we really need to make sure that as soon as someone joins the community and wants to contribute, that we can give them a list immediately and show them, okay, this is something you could get started with. And of course, they could do that right now by going to GitHub and filtering. But um, you probably also would appreciate if there's a, a link or some list somewhere that you can just click open and get started. 
So that's it for being transparent and open in terms of um, new new code changes and reviewing those. Mm -hmm. So that's for, for the technical side of things. And I think if you look at the, the next topic here, being quick and consistent with your responses also goes for those code reviews. Because if someone contributes something, you want to make sure that they know that their contribution is valued. Now, we had an issue where some pull requests have been open for multiple years, which is way too long. Just imagine if you contribute something to an open source product you love, and then it literally takes years for the team behind it to come to get back to you and to approve it. It would still be great if they approve it and get the code merged into the product, but still you would have a bit of a negative feeling because it took so long. And that's something we've been working very hard on addressing. Um, yeah, and we we have to we we had this happen to us a few times that it, it really took a few years to to respond. And then the only thing you can do really is just to be honest and tell them what you're going to do to improve and to actually make sure that their contributions are valued. So we're giving everyone a very fair amount of time to reply to questions we're asking. So even if someone uh, contributed three years ago, we are not expecting them to reply to our questions tomorrow because we are late to the game by answering to their uh, to the contributions. So we can't expect them to come back to us within a few days as well. So I think we've been doing a great job in this area because in the, at the beginning of this year, we were over 300 pull requests that were still open, which is a lot. And uh, we've gone under 200 a few times now. It remains a challenge. And of course, the more contributors we have, the better. But uh, we've been making great progress in many areas here. So um, let me see. Yeah, we have one more bullet in this slide. Document every step of the contribution journey in extreme detail. This is especially important. Like I just mentioned, you want to make sure that everyone has a smooth experience from the moment they they contribute to Mautic as a product. Um, I don't know, Ruth, if you want to, uh, to elaborate a bit more on this because it doesn't only go for code and for the technical side of things, but pretty much for everything, also for marketing and for translations, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. And when we first formed the teams, one of the first thing I asked the team leaders to do was actually put together an onboarding process and have someone in their team who was dedicated to helping onboard new people. I think what Leon has done in the education team is really great. So if you go to the knowledge base and you look at contribute in the menu item, he's written it all out. Like basically, if you've already got some, something and you don't want to you know, work on it, but you are, are okay for us to use it, fling it to us in an email. You know, here's a video if you want to learn how to contribute it through adding it to our Jira board, contributing it to GitHub, you know, the whole step. And it's also written out in text and there's also a, and if you get really stuck, just email us. And I think that's really important, particularly when I was first a new contributor, I got really frustrated when there were steps missing, like it was assumed that I knew things and um, particularly about the product, but also about like understanding what I had to do with SSH keys. Like I didn't know that I was a marketer. Like <laughs> I know what an SSH key is. So you kind I know some people think, oh, why are you talking to all this? And it's like, because it's important that people understand. And you can just skim read if you know it. So yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's crucial. Yeah. So this one was an important one as well. And I think we're still working on this. This is why it says work in progress. <laughs> so we definitely need the technical folk, like Dennis was saying, particularly on those tier two and tier three pull requests. We need to have someone who knows their way around Mautic, look at the code and check to make sure that it's not going to cause any problems or that it's not doing something that is going to cause issues at scale, for example. But we also need to have people who... Um, are just there to meet and greet contributors. So, you know, like to greet someone when they make their first pull request and say, thank you so much for making that pull request. That is amazing. Here's the next steps we need to go to. Or the first time someone rocks up in Slack and complains about a documentation page, it's out of date. You know, like meeting them kindly, greeting them kindly and say, hey, did you notice that edit button at the bottom? Would you like me to talk you through how to do this? 
you know, that doesn't need to be someone technical. It needs to be someone with people skills. Marketeers, people who actually use the tool in the world. So, so important to have in the product team. Very much lacking in the product team right now. We definitely yes. need more marketers. And if Yossi is watching right now, he'll be like, because he keeps complaining about this. And I keep saying we need to find a way to bring people in who use Mortic and who are not developers to give feedback to developers. Otherwise, it becomes a product that's built by developers who don't use the tool, which is, yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. also, yeah, documentation writers, media creators. So if you love creating videos, every time we do a re new release, it would be lovely to have a video telling people about the features or the bug fixes, introducing the people who've worked on the release. We're really lacking in um, user interface, user accessibility, uh, UX and accessibility experts. I definitely want to make more tickets as accessible as possible. Um, as a disabled person myself, it's really dear to my heart. And I think as a web application, we need to enable people to use Mautic regardless of their physical or other conditions. And, you know, in my opinion, diversity in every sense of the word helps us to serve our users better. So I'm not just talking about diversity in terms of gender, but also in terms of where people are located, their cultural backgrounds, their understanding of Mautic and beginners to experience and all of the breadth we just talked about. Yeah, absolutely. That This is something that I think the discussions we've been having in the product team have mostly been on the technical side of things, which mm. is really necessary as well, because there's just a lot of things yeah. to go through. But it, yeah, we would so, so much welcome marketeers and people from a non-technical background as well to have a lot more balance. Um, I, I also mentioned in my presentation earlier today that um, at some point, because you're a developer, you might get biased as well. Because yeah. if you have the technical knowledge, you know what is happening behind the scenes, which might not make sense for a marketeer or an end user of the product. So 100 yeah. percent we, we need more yeah. non-technical people in the in the product team. And I totally remember from the very early days of Mortic before it was released in stable, some features that I was using. I was just like, why did you make it do it like this? You would never do it like this. <laughs> You know, I probably wasn't particularly kind in the way I expressed that at the time. But as a user, I just couldn't see why it had been written like that. Because as a, you know, a marketer, there's no way I would have gone through that flow. And things have really improved, but we can always get better in that area, for sure. Yeah. So did yeah, you so want to talk to this one? Yeah, so this is really to, to build up upon what we just discussed. It, if you have a more diverse team, it means that you have developers, translators, designers, marketeers, etc. Because this mix is what makes it powerful. Because what, what is a good product without proper documentation or without proper translations? Um, it, it, it just everything is just so important. And it's, I think it's very challenging from what we've seen to actually get this diverse team up and running. Uh, but once you have them, make sure that really you ensure that they understand how they add value to the team so that they really understand, okay, this is where I can add value to this product and together we make something great. And this is something I think we can do more as a community to really value each other more because of course, people who are very active, they get a lot of, a lot of compliments, but there are so many people doing things behind the scenes as well that you might not always yeah. see that need a lot more, uh, yeah, how to say, uh, a lot more positive feedback, in my opinion. Yeah, for sure, I agree. So, yeah, it's, um, this is something that for me personally has been very crucial and Ruth knows everything about it. Um, <laughs> I really tend to get, yeah, how to say, there's just so many things that need to happen and i'm quite enthusiastic to get things moving and the more you work with the product and with the community the more passionate you become about it as well so if for example there's a crucial bug that needs to be fixed i'm just sitting here like oh this is so ugly we really need to fix this and then if no one else has time then i'm very likely to spend like late evening on the weekend to get it fixed um so in order to prevent my mental health from suffering 
uh, I really had to time box my, my contributions to Mautic. And I think that's what a lot of people are struggling with. So mm -hmm. of course, the more contributors we have, the better. And together we can facilitate a, a discussion where we really say like, okay, I'm going to spend two hours a week to work on this specific feature. So everyone involved knows what's going to happen and who's doing what. It, just, it does take a lot of communication, but it's so worth it if you do it pro properly. Mm. It's the same with, yeah, it's like setting these expectations properly. And if you really cannot, cannot make it, because, I mean, everyone has other obligations, right? In, in private life, at work, um, you sometimes have to, have to step back for a while. And that's just uh, what it yeah. is. Just keep communicating, I'd say, and keep this positive, uh, positive attitude towards everyone, and then you can make it happen. And this one is, uh, is a nice one to, uh, to end this specific topic. So, of course, it's always a lot of fun to jump into something and to, to contribute. But that doesn't mean that uh, you can just come and do things whenever you want. Of course, it's, your work is appreciated a lot. But it just makes a lot more sense if everyone knows when uh, things are going to happen and what is going to happen. So, really make sure that you communicate clearly what your intentions are and when you expect to do to do your contributions. I don't know. And I think also, like, things change, don't they? Like, you know, loved ones get sick or something comes up in work and you respond. And I think it's so, so important that people understand that if they're not able to do something, it's fine, but they just need to communicate and say, I'm really sorry I've taken on too much. I need to drop this. Can someone else pick it up? Um, rather yeah. than just suffer in silence and either not do it or completely exhaust yourself. Um, so it's much better to be in communication. Absolutely. Yeah. Ah, this is a big one. <laughs> Do you want me to talk through this one? Um, or you can. Let's, let's do it together. So on the left-hand mm -hmm. side, you see a, a graph of the issues and pull requests. And you see at the beginning of this year, we were well over a 900, I think. And now mm. you can see how, how sharply the, the line is decreasing. I think the community has been doing an amazing job to, uh, to, yeah, to work through the backlog, um, especially in the product team and a lot of other contributors who have stepped up to, uh, to help. Um, so yeah, we really needed to, to push a lot of things forward because if you still are suffering from that backlog, it just gets harder to introduce new features. Mm. And yeah, I think... I think yeah. Sorry, go for it. No, go ahead. I just wanted to uh, head over to you. I think I think we had to be quite careful because obviously, like you mentioned earlier, there were some pull requests that had been around for a couple of years. And so um, we tried to be really clear to people and we said, like, oh, we'll try and get this merged in the next release. Can you try and fix these conflicts? And if there was no response, we bumped it back by another release. So that was two months. And then we got to the point where we said, right, OK, if you don't respond within 14 days, we're either going to close this pull request or find someone to take it on because we don't want to have lots of pull requests open dangling with nobody contributing. And the vast majority of people either responded or they didn't respond and we closed it or we, we took on the PR. We had one or two people who were quite upset and quite uh, angry about the fact that we hadn't merged their PR for two years and now we were giving them two and a half months notice to update their <laughs> PR. Yeah. And we just responded with kindness and understanding because we would be just as angry as they were if it was us in their shoes. Um, so yeah, that's what this next point is about, seeing if it's a valuable PR, if someone else can pull that and then work on it and push it back. And then we close the old one, but make sure that the original author gets credited for the work that they had done. And then you can also credit the person who took on the PR and got it over the line. We've had quite a few pull requests like that. But it's only right to give credit where credit's due. Um, and this one ties into what you were saying, Dennis. Sometimes you have to actually do the work yourself. I, I tested so many issues in Mautic to see if they still existed in Mautic 3. And then I got pinged on a couple of issues I had raised three years ago saying, this is still exists in Mautic 3. <laughs> so I had to test my own. So yeah, sometimes you will have to just work through that technical debt, it, you just have to, you know, like find a rainy day, get a cup of tea, and just get on with it because nobody else is going to do it for you. Ultimately. Yeah. And we knew from the beginning that it was a monster of a job that we were about to do. But I think yeah. just everyone has been making so, so much progress. 
So yeah, and for me, the biggest thing was having it as an OKR. I was like, I have got to get the issues down by 100. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, makes sense. And so I did it a bit every week, you know? So I yeah. would go and do a bit every week. Yeah. So... So for, for the sake of time, I think this, this um, slide we can go through quite quickly because mm -hmm. what it, um, just feel free to show all the bullets already. Uh, really what we've been doing to, in order to keep up the pace is to also in, introduce um, frequent releases so that people mm -hmm. know that actually things are moving quite fast. You can see here that every month, at least once a month, there's a new release. So people know that the things are moving and like it's mentioned here, there's a beating heart in the project. And I think that's what ha what's, um, what has been sort of engaging a lot of new contributors as well to see this activity coming back into the product. Mm. So yeah, the, I think on, on in all areas, this is just so valuable to have something like this. And yeah. because we, we, um, we, we have sometimes feature releases, but we also have bug fix releases so it really helps us to focus on specific things and then work on those mm. for a specific release. And yeah, that, that's the main takeaway for, for this slide. Okay, yeah. so this one was about organizations. Um, did you want to speak on this one, Dennis? Yeah, sure. So for, for in my situation, personally, I run my own company. So, and because I'm passionate about open source, I spend time on it. But I know that there's companies out there who actually support or motivate their employees to contribute to open source software, for example. Could be from a technical side or a non-technical side, doesn't really matter. Um, so if they are able to do it within their regular work times, that is even better because you are not expecting people to do th stuff in their free time. And there's a lot less risk for someone to burn out as well if they really have their, their private time to just sit back, relax, recover from, from a, a heavy week, for example. Um, I think this is very important and something that a lot more organizations need to do moving forward, especially software companies, because mm -hmm. they know they're using a lot of open source software to offer their services to their customers, which they are making money with. So I think it's only fair to expect to give back to the open source community one way or the other. It can be by letting the employees spend time on the actual product or by donating money. For example, with Mautic, we have the open collective now. We have GitHub sponsors. So organizations can sponsor the project, which will also contribute to events like this, Mauticon, or to further developments of the software. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so important that that for sustainability and open source. Yeah. So if we look at an example, what people in those organizations could do is to, uh, is to look at uh, code contributions. So, so you see it here. Sometimes technical knowledge is needed and sometimes not. Uh, we are really trying to motivate uh, creators of pull requests to come up with clear test instructions. That allows us to triage the PRs a lot more easily because we can see if it's something that a non-technical person can test or that an actual developer needs to test or look into the code. Sometimes both. I mean, if it's a, if it's a more complex PR, then you need a review from both the technical and the, yeah, the, mm -hmm. the user side of things. And uh, yeah, that's what you see here. We're really, we're really putting a lot of effort into making this process more streamlined. Yeah. Okay, so where are we now? So this is a chart that shows all community engagement. That includes engagement on your code from Git and GitHub. It includes Slack, forums, and more tech, um, meetup groups, sorry, across the whole community. And we're excluding employees from Acquia and Mautic Inc. So this is showing only community contributions and you can see we had quite a significant dip between sort of 2017-18 really crashed but we've been having a much bigger trend upwards in the community engagement particularly this year but mostly from sort of september last year onwards are seeing a really big improvement and that's fantastic i mean that's what we want to see really um 
we've made a huge progress with technical debt. I mean, Dennis mentioned that. So these are the numbers. So we started in January with 932 issues and 332 pull requests. By July, we were down to 444 and 218. By September, just gone, we were 280 and 209. And our aim is to get under 100 issues and PRs by the end of the year. And it's my birthday on New Year's Eve. <laughs> so it will be like a combined birthday and Christmas present if we get to under 100 pull requests and issues. <laughs> it's ambitious, but I think it's it would be amazing if we can make this happen. This it happen. would be. It would be. And just to think of how far we've come as well, that's the thing, isn't yeah. it? So. Absolutely. So the, the last thing that we want to discuss in this presentation is automated tests. Now, these things are great for a variety of reasons, but I got to be honest, there are some people who hate me, especially because I've been pushing very hard for this. Um, the thing is, like, imagine if you have to test every part of Matic, so every small change on every small change. So you, if you've worked with the product before, you know that there's a lot of sections in there. There's contacts, segments, campaigns, just imagine how many possible use cases there are. There's also a configuration area. So there's a lot of potential combinations of use cases and configurations. So you potentially have thousands or more um, unique configurations that are possible. Mm -hmm. And it's just not humanly possible to test the whole product on every single change. But the good thing is that computers are good and fast at repetitive testing. And that's where automated tests come in. And this is what you see here in the video is that the computer is basically going through a lot of aspects in Mautic, like creating a new contact, creating a new campaign, uh, editing it, removing it, just like a normal user would do. The, the software will actually click on all the buttons. And I think that's just incredibly powerful. It, it just looks like magic if you look at it, right? <laughs> I wish I could work that fast, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? We could just go that fast. Yeah, it's a huge improvement to be able to have these tests. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So if, if we look into the importance of the automated tests, which is the, the next uh, slide, these things are, are here for a reason, actually. Um, the thing is that, like I just mentioned, you cannot humanly test everything in every ch single change. So this is important to have the automated tests because you can ensure that existing functionality keeps working and it enhances the overall stability of the product. What we've seen in the last few months is that when we fixed a bug or we introduced a new feature, that it broke something somewhere else in the product. And this is what you can prevent for a very large part with automated tests. It also motivates developers to write high quality code. What you see on the left-hand side is the feedback that developers will get when they contribute something and put it on GitHub. So GitHub will actually trigger a pipeline which will walk through all the automated tests and the system will literally tell you when something is wrong and where it went wrong. So it becomes very easy for the developer to fix the problem um, before, we, before the problem even reaches the end users. So that's fantastic. But the, the downside that we have currently is that only 32% of Matic's backend is covered by automated tests. So you have a backend, what is happening behind the scenes and you have a front end, which you saw in the previous slide, what the actual users are interacting with. Now, 100% code coverage is something you shouldn't aim for. It's not, it shouldn't be a goal in itself to get to 100%, because why would you, for example, if I have an umbrella, or sorry, if I have a plant, why would I water a plant upside down? It doesn't make sense, right? So you also need to write meaningful tests so that they actually reflect uh, real user behavior. So just to summarize this and to, to show you what we're doing in Matic to improve the automated tests is that um, every pull request, and this is something we introduced recently, needs to keep the test coverage either the same or increase it. That means that if someone in, writes new code, which is not tested by the automated tests, they will get a notification that they actually need to write tests. So that way we can slowly but steadily increase the code coverage of the product. We also recently started to write end-to-end -end tests and big shout out to Equia for taking the lead here. 
Um, this is something we're looking to, in, um, to implement in the community version of Mozic soon. It's the one you just saw in the video. Um, yeah, like I just mentioned, we're really working hard to gradually increase the test coverage. And that's what we're doing to actually make uh, Mozic as a product a lot more stable and reliable. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, um, yeah, I think that's a great way to, to wrap up this presentation. Um, mm -hmm. I think we've all learned a lot about managing a community and uh, just contributions in general in, in 2020. Even though we have the whole COVID situation and things are a lot different, I think we've made an impressive amount of progress throughout the whole product. I don't know yeah, if you want to add some. Agree. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. 100%. So I'm just checking if there, there's any questions that came in, but we don't have any questions. <laughs> so apparently our story was very clear. It was so amazing that nobody has anything else that they're unclear about, about contributions and open source. <laughs> yeah. No, honestly, I think it was great to actually reflect on, on the past year, or yeah. on the year, like all the stuff we've done. I think all the teams have been doing an insane job just to, to get things going in so many areas. Yeah. And I think also I'm not, I wouldn't say that either of us would think that we're perfect, you know, like. Some of our documentation for onboarding is a bit ropey, um, yeah. particularly in non-product team areas is a little bit ropey and we definitely need to improve that. Um, but yeah, you have to start somewhere and a lot of the time it just takes someone to actually take up the reins and say, right, I'm going to write that documentation. And I seem to remember you did that with the developer onboarding because you've been through it three or four times with new contributors and were like, I just want to send them to a page to read it and ask me if I get stuck. Rather yeah. than have over and over again you know yeah but the, the thing is um of course you want to be very welcoming to people and to to show them that you're listening yeah. and it, it easily shows you where things need to be improved but then mm -hmm. to actually improve the that those sections it takes a lot of time because on yeah. the one hand you have to spend time to to reply to to, to take the feedback and to collect it somewhere and then to actually make it happen is a whole different story because you will need to dive into that specific area of the product and then write the documentation mm -hmm. about it. So yeah. I really would like to say that if there are people out there who uh, who are trying to join uh, in the multi community and you are running into some problems because the documentation is not clear or anything, please make your voice heard. Uh, you can do it on a variety of channels like the forums, like Slack. There's a lot of different ways to do it. And yeah, if you have time, it would be fantastic if you would like to help us to contribute uh, to the documentation as well. Especially with new contributors, this is crucial because you have a fresh perspective on the product and on the documentation. So you are in a unique position to actually uh, identify the areas that need a lot of attention. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And also I think what I find really helpful is when we get complete newcomers to Maltic who are trying to find their way through how to get started because it's helpful for us to know how disjointed processes are. And it's helpful for us to know what would you be thinking? Like where would you think you would find those resources and why? So we can understand how we can make that process a bit, a bit better. Um, so yeah. I'm, I would say I'm fine to receive ranty emails or Slack messages. Just tone it down a tiny bit, but it's fine. If you're getting cross with something and you can't find it, please tell us because we can try and work with you to figure out what would be better. Yeah, absolutely. And I think everyone is doing their absolute best to, to improve things on so many areas. Mm -hmm. So um, there, there's a lot of work ahead of us. But I think if we look back at the past few months, all the things that have, that have happened, I think it really helped to professionalize the community and the, the way we work and interact. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right, let's uh, let's wrap it up here. Uh, I'm not seeing any yeah. other questions. I think we we had a yeah a, a great session, great contents to share with uh, with the audience. Of course, mm -hmm. the session has been recorded, so you can always watch it back whenever is convenient for you. And for now, I'm I'm just gonna. Uh, leave it to this. This was the last session in track four, actually. Um, there's going to be a few more sessions in the other tracks. And then right after it, we have the closing keynote, which is with both Eki and, and Ruth. So uh, be sure to, to be there as well. 
I gotta admit, it's it's been a long day, but um, I'm I'm oh, really yeah. I'm really staying here to uh, to also watch until the cl the closing keynote. Yeah. So thank you for watching, and um, I hope to see you in the other sessions later today. Okay. Bye.